Hello. In this poem, we're discussing one of the most famous poems in English and American literature. It's Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, written by the American poet Robert Frost. It was written in 1922 and published in 1923 in a collection of his poems called New Hampshire. The poem is told by a traveller who stops his journey to watch the snowfall in a landscape of woods and beside a frozen lake. The traveller uses the opportunity to reflect on his own life. The poem also reflects Frost's own troubled life and the great uncertainty many artists faced following the First World War. But more of that later. Before we start, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Many, many thanks. I have the poem here, so let's start. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. If you found the poem melodic and rhythmic, it's because Frost was a superb crafter of poems and Stopping by Woods is written in perfect iambic tetrameter. Frost uses a tight-knit chain rhyme form called the Rubaiyat stanza, and we'll examine this later. But first, I'm going to start with a line-by-line -line analysis of the poem, and then explore its themes. Then I'll place the poem in its historical context. The first stanza establishes the situation the speaker breaks his journey to watch the snowfall at night. Written in the first person voice, the speaker shares his innermost thoughts and feelings, creating a strong bond with us from the start. The first two lines reveal the speaker's thought processes. He confides in us that he thinks he knows the woods owner who lives in the village some distance from the woods. This detail immediately establishes a feeling of solitariness and isolation and signals that this poem is highly likely to be a reflective piece. It also introduces uncertainty. He only thinks he knows. Uncertainty is a theme the poem explores. In stanza one, we learn that because the woods owner lives in the village, he will not witness the speaker stopping by his woods to watch the snow scene. Line four establishes that the poem takes place in winter. And later, when we learn it is the darkest evening of the year, this creates an ominous mood. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. Having set the scene, stanza two, lines five to eight, continues the theme of isolation and solitariness. We learn there is no farmhouse nearby, away from civilization, the farmhouse and village represent. Frost places the speaker 
in the natural world. His only companion is his horse, who must think it strange that his owner has suddenly stopped in such an isolated spot and in such unfriendly weather. We are told on line 7 he stopped between the woods and a frozen lake. Frozen stresses the coldness and makes us question why the speaker would stop in this harsh landscape, in what could be described as a miserable situation. In line 8 we learn that the darkest evening of the year this might describe the time, but hint at the speaker's state of mind. Perhaps he is at a low point in his life. Using pathetic fallacy, the falling snow, frozen lake and darkest evening may reflect the speaker's mental and emotional state. He's in a dark place, feeling miserable, depressed even. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. We are told the horse likely thinks his owner's decision queer, meaning strange, or curious to choose such a spot to stop, especially given the miserable conditions and harsh environment. Frost employs anthropomorphism, ascribing human qualities to the animal. Perhaps the horse senses a danger in the spot, while the speaker does not. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. In stanza 3, lines 9 to 12, show the horse's concern. The poet is unspecific whether he is mounted on the horse or has dismounted. If he were dismounted, the sense of danger is heightened and we understand fully why his horse might shake his harness bells. Bells suggest danger, like an alarm bell, perhaps even the tolling of a bell, and highlight the danger the speaker is in. Yet, he ignores or is oblivious to this. Such is his state of mind. Perhaps the horse senses a dark mood or depression in the speaker and attempts to shake him out of his dark thoughts. The horse's action references a theme in literature that animals are more attuned to our emotional states or danger than humans. Frost juxtaposes the horse's sense of self-preservation and sensibleness with the speaker's apparent disregard for his safety, creating tension and drama and making us want to read on. In lines 11 and 12, Frost indicates why the speaker might stop on such a dreary evening. He finds the bleakness attractive. Despite the cold and dark, he is drawn to the quiet it offers. The silence is interrupted only by the horse's bell and the only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The use of sibilance in sound, sweep and easy creates a calming quality. Assonance lengthens the lines, forcing us to slow our reading or reciting and creating a mood of contentment and a lingering sensation. Downy suggests the snow's soft surface, which covers the ground like a blanket of eiderdown. But it also brings connotation of sleep. Perhaps the scene's beauty tempts the speaker to rest, even to sleep, despite the danger of freezing to death. Ironically, Downy suggests warmth, 
like a blanket. Despite the danger, he is attracted to nature's allure. Perhaps Frost presents nature as an evil force that deliberately entices him to stay, sleep and die. He is in danger. Stanza 4 carries on the theme of nature as alluring, enticing but dangerous. Fittingly, on line 13, a number associated with misfortune, he presents the woods as an attractive entity through passive personification, seducing him to enter. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Dark compliments lovely, dark beauty, as if the woods are a beautiful person, seducing him. Deep suggests it is a place for adventure, but also like dark, where he could easily be lost should he step inside to explore. Dark and deep suggests the woods offer concealment, a place to hide away from life's pressures something the speaker also finds attractive. The theme of nature's beauty, but its danger, is supported through the antithesis, lovely but dark and deep, where one could easily get lost or fall. Line 14 is Volta-like, as in a sonnet. Although this is not a sonnet, we have a turning point in the poem. He wrenches himself from the woods, nature's pull, but signals this change. The speaker turns from the present and projects himself into the future. I have promises to keep. The moment is like breaking a spell and the woods seductive hold is broken. Perhaps he realises the danger of stopping too long by the woods. The cold might kill him. And we are told that he has miles to go before he sleeps. Anaphora stresses this need to leave and to move on. In line 14, promises creates a sense of mystery. Are these promises to himself or promises to others? These commitments occupy his mind and nature's spell is seemingly broken. I say seemingly for reasons that we'll explore shortly. Why would Woods and a snowy evening hold him in thrall? We can only guess. Frost encourages us to fill in the gaps and create a story. Perhaps the speaker felt life's pressures and needed a moment of calm. And the natural world can provide these moments, space to stop and assess where we are in our lives. Nature allows for the kind of quiet reflection people may struggle to find in their busy lives amid society's hugger mugger and pressures. Nature's capacity to let us reconnect with ourselves is one reason we enjoy the solitude and peace walking or hiking in the countryside and mountains affords. In the poem, once his spiritual stock taking is over, he realises he must complete his journey and fulfil his commitments. Miles to go might mean the journey he's on, or figuratively, life's journey. Before I sleep can be read to mean before he finishes his long journey, or the death that awaits everyone who travels life's path. We meet the speaker mid-journey, perhaps at a crossroads in his life. As I mentioned before, 
he only thinks he knows the woods owner and uncertainty is employed to reflect the uncertainty we feel at some stage in our lives. The lovely dark deep woods bring associations of death, which he resists. He has much to achieve, much to accomplish before he dies. And there's an acceptance at the end. The speaker's tone is accepting that you must move on in life. You have to go on. However, the poem's ending is ambiguous. We'll examine this now. The final stanza introduces a tension between responsibility and freedom. Although there's an ending to this poem, there's no clear resolution. We are left asking if the speaker is satisfied with the thought that he has these obligations to meet and must literally and figuratively move on. Does the speaker actually move on and leave the woods? Frost leaves him deciding to move on, but the repetition of the last two lines is only a projection, as though he is willing himself to move. We never learn if he does. Now, let's consider how poetry and form support the poem's themes. The entire work is written in iambic tetrameter, meaning four iams, or unstressed, stressed beats, which make up an eight-syllable line. Whose words these are, I think I know. Again, it's a meter which reflects the human heartbeat. Reflecting the speaker is at an emotional point in their life and their emotional response to nature's snow-filled beauty. The woods and snow are symbolically important. The scene he is attracted to is a dead landscape. Only he and the horse are alive and have the freedom to stay or move on. The landscape and scenario Frost presents to us support the theme that we are actors in this world and able to make choices, to break or fulfil the promises to ourselves and to others. Therefore, this is a poem with a major theme of agency, the freedom to make decisions and to act upon them. The choice to stay or leave are opposites in the poem. The juxtapositioning of the present tense, watching the woods fill with snow, and projection into the future, but I have promises to keep, demonstrates these tensions. The poem is melodic, as enticing as the woods. For example, in line one, Frost uses several techniques to create a melodic sounding line. He uses soft W sounds in whose woods and the assonance in the internal oo sound in these words plus the alliterative th sound in these and think. He also uses sibilance, the S sounds in whose woods and these. These techniques combine to give the line a melodic sound that flows off the tongue. The sound reinforces the imagery. The use of iambic tetrameter here creates a melodic lullaby, implying that nature has lulled the speaker into sleep or a trance. Indeed, sibilance in the last two stanzas supports the impression that nature is singing the speaker to sleep, siren-like. For example, gives his harness bells a shake is some 
mistake sounds the sweep easy woods miles sleep miles sleep along with maintaining the iambic tetrameter is the poem's overall formal structure frost uses a b a rhyme scheme in which the first second and fourth lines of each quatrain rhyme while the third line is unrhymed this rhyme will however be carried into subsequent stanzas in the case of these lines though no and snow rhyme the meter and rhyme scheme creates a sing-song rhythm which flows making it easier for the reader to remember the poem's content and important themes. The poem's ambiguous ending is highlighted in the final lines 15 and 16 with the repetition and end stop lines. At first reading, the end stop lines suggest a resolution. The speaker's mind is made up and he is determined to journey on. But it's uncertain whether the speaker leaves the woods to fulfill the promises he must keep, or whether he stays in the woods, wavering between obligation and personal desire to lose himself in the peace and quiet the woods afford. The choice of winter may symbolise death, when all things die, yet Frost presents an alluring snow scene that suggests the speaker sees death as something not to be feared but welcomed. It reflects the speaker's state of mind. Another reading is the snow scene allows the speaker the space to contemplate his mortality, and that death is the end of life's journey and he has many things to achieve before then. This reading gives the poem an optimistic framing. He resists this death urge by realising he has miles to go before I sleep. Frost therefore presents us with two destinations. The short term destination, wherever the speaker is going, and a longer journey, life's journey, ultimately to death, but populated with commitments, promises to ourselves and others, which we doggedly try to fulfil. In this respect, the poem acts as a memento mori, a reminder that even amid life, death is ever present. So we should focus on the now and fill our days. Again, this introduces the popular poetic theme of Carpe Deum, seize or harvest the day while we can. A sobering thought. The use of epizusis, a special form of repetition, in the final two lines impresses the reader that the miles seem endless to the speaker. Therefore, Underlying the poem's simple story is a sophisticated structure, lending formality and gravitas to the themes it explores. A significant feature is the poem's four quatrains, written as rubaiyat stanzas. A rubaiyat is a chain rhyme scheme, in which one rhyme from a stanza carries over into the next, creating an interlocking structure. For example, he gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. The Rubaiyat form was made famous in the English speaking world by Edward Fitzgerald's translation of the 12th century Persian poet Omar Khayyam's work. The poem also nods towards Dante's use of terza rima, 
another form of interlocking chain rhyme. This chain rhyme also creates a carefully constructed unity in the poem and a link which reflects the speaker's chain of thought. It also creates this seamless sing-song effect in the poem, like a lullaby. The lullaby is an apt poetic form because it offers a gentle tune that often hides something complicated or darker. For example, think about the lyrics to Rockaby Baby and what they suggest. On closer reading, the poet may be suggesting that freedom or rest from our toils is only to be found in death. So the poem follows a chain rhyme in which one rhyme from each stanza is carried into the next. And it's creating that interlocking structure in this case. The first, second and fourth line of every stanza rhyme while the third doesn't. The third line, however, rhymes with the first, second and fourth lines of the following stanza. Then in the final stanza, the lines resolve into one continuing rhyme and result in the following scheme. A, B, A, B, C, B, B, C, D, C, C, D, 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 D. And the only deviation from this perfectly constructed rhyme scheme is the repetition in the final two lines, which makes those two lines profound. They stand out from the rest of the lines, highlighting their importance. The speaker is anonymous. Perhaps he or she represents everybody who has been in a dark place in their lives and wishes for temporary respite from life's troubles. Equally, the woods are anonymous, reflecting the universal themes the poet is exploring. The story could take place anywhere in a winter landscape. Having said that, the speaker may also to an extent, represent frost, and elements of this poem may be considered autobiographical. Typical of Frost's work, he uses simple stories set in rural landscapes, referencing nature to explore deeper themes and fuel his philosophical musings. He wrote Stopping by Woods in 1923, which appeared in his anthology titled New Hampshire. The collection included poems we have considered in earlier videos, including Fire and Ice and Nothing Gold Can Stay. New Hampshire marked a watershed in Frost's writing career because it won him the Pulitzer Prize. Regarding the historical context, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening was written several years after World War I, which forced Frost to leave England and return to the United States. The 1920s was a period when poets and other artists grappled with the uncertainty the Great War had caused regarding the individual's place in society and their relationship with religion. It was a time when many lost their sense of purpose and meaning. The poem speaker demonstrates perhaps ennui, lethargy, which he later discards on realising that he must go on and fulfil his promise. The poem, therefore, does contain autobiographical elements. Promises might relate to Frost's writing talent that he intends to fulfil, and the promises he had given his close friend, Edward Thomas. While living in England, Edward Thomas, an older 
established writer had been Frost's friend and mentor and had encouraged him to dedicate his life to full-time writing. Thomas was killed in the First World War and Frost grieved greatly. Perhaps one of these promises he has to keep is to honour Thomas by fulfilling his writing potential. Frost and Thomas's relationship is explored in my video, The Road Not Taken. On a general level, the poem reflects a very human need, some time to assess and reassess our life's journey and our priorities. Whether this poem is the speaker's meditation on solitude or a foreboding and ominous symbol of despair suggested in the snow scene's powerful pull, or both, is left ambiguous. It's left to us to decide. The mark of a great poem written by a great poet. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting and useful. If so, please hit the like button below. Also check out our other videos on writing and textual analysis, including analysis of Robert Frost poems. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Many, many thanks. Until next time, write well.